It's just gone 11 o'clock and tonight's essay is called On Being Too Much for Ourselves. Psychotherapist Adam Phillips explores how from adolescence onwards some people can begin to find that they are too much for themselves, that there's something excessive about themselves that disturbs them and what they do about it. His theme tonight is risk and why it might be addictive. It's not unusual for us to feel that life is too much for us. And it's not unusual to feel that we really should be up to it, that there may be too much to cope with, too many demands, but that we should have the wherewithal to deal with it. Faced with the stresses and strains of everyday life, it's easy now for people to feel that they are failing. And what they are failing at, one way or another, is managing the ordinary excesses that we are all beset by. Too much frustration, too much bad feeling, too little love, too little success, and so on. Indeed, one of the things people most frequently say in psychoanalysis is, perhaps I'm overreacting, but... And one of the commonest complaints today is about feeling too much or feeling too little. I want to suggest that we are simply too much for ourselves, but that this too muchness is telling us something important. In tomorrow night's essay, I will show how our solution to being too much for ourselves has traditionally been to believe that there is someone we are not too much for, called God. But tonight I want to begin with a simple proposition and see where it takes us. My proposition is that it is impossible to overreact. That when we call our reactions overreactions, it's simply because they're stronger than we would like them to be. In other words, we sometimes call ourselves and other people excessive as a way of invalidating or tempering the truths they have to tell us. It is impossible to overreact. One of Freud's now famous examples of the overreaction is the Freudian slip, when we say more than we intend. A person I was seeing in psychoanalysis once said to me, Don't you think fraud is rather overrated? He had meant to say Freud and he blushed. Embarrassment, blushing, is, of course, a sign of excess. The excessive bodily reaction to excessive self-exposure. In that moment, he had said both what he wanted to say and rather more than he wanted to say. When we make Freudian slips, we try and cover our tracks by claiming that we have said more than we mean, when in fact we have meant more than we had wanted to say. This man also thought that Freud was a fraud, and that, of course, is something worth considering, as is the idea that fraud is overrated. When we make Freudian slips, we may feel like we are saying too much, but we may be saying just the right amount, adding things to the conversation that are worth talking about. We can't decide not to make Freudian slips, but even when we use ordinary language intentionally, we often say more than we intend. If I say to you that I am a great admirer of your work, I'm telling you about my greatness as well as yours. When I say, see you tomorrow, I'm assuming I know what is going to happen in the interim. Our language, without which we couldn't imagine our lives, is too much for us, in the sense that it can surprise us. We hear in it, and we say in it, more than we want to. We spend our earliest years looking and hearing and touching and smelling before we can speak. Language comes to us, in a sense, quite late in the day. And these so-called early years are, to put it mildly, years of intense feeling. What the critic Lee Edelman calls, in a deliberately provocative phrase, the fascist face of the baby, captures something of the sheer power of the child's feelings and their effect on the people around them. If the cry of a crying baby wasn't, in some sense, too much for us, something we have to respond to, something we need to stop, if possible, the baby wouldn't survive. And all parents at some time feel overwhelmed by their children, feel that their children ask more of them than they can provide. Desire, Freud said, is always in excess of the object's capacity to satisfy it. One of the most difficult things about being a parent is that you have to bear the fact that you have to frustrate your child, have to make your child suffer more than he wants to. And this means every parent has to bear being hated by their children. And hatred between parents and children always feels excessive. We've all had the experience as children of being too much for someone, 
of making someone feel things that they don't want to feel. Before you have children, the novelist Faye Weldon once said, you can believe you are a nice person. After you have children, you understand how wars start. Everyone starts with the experience of being too much for someone else. Not only with that experience, but with that experience somewhere in the mix of who one is. Before we acquire the excesses of language, we have lived with the excesses of need. If, even only occasionally as a child, you are too much for your parents, which then means you are too much for yourself, what can you do? If I was to summarise my previous talks, I could say that we call someone's behaviour excessive when it does harm which seems unnecessary to us, or when it inflicts more suffering than we think it should. The child who finds himself being too much for his parents, and this is all children to some extent, experiences himself as in some way harming them. And as the child's survival depends upon his parents or those that look after him, this puts him in mortal danger. For this reason alone, it makes it very difficult for the child and for the adult that he will become to think of his too muchness as anything other than a problem. How could being too much for other people and for oneself be anything other than something one needs to get over? How can making the people you love suffer be in any sense a good thing? We can begin to make some sense of this, perhaps, by asking a simple question. Why do people exaggerate? If you fear not being listened to, if you assume that you are easily forgotten or can't find a place in other people's minds, you are going to have to do something extreme to hold their attention. I am more likely to get a seat on the bus if I say I have a heart condition than if I say I don't like standing up. Exaggeration is an attempt to capture someone's imagination, to get a hearing. We are excessive when something about ourselves needs to be recognised and we need other people to help us work out what it is. We are too much for ourselves because there is far more to us, we feel more, than we can manage. People didn't overreact to the death of Diana. Through the death of Diana they recognised just how much grief they were bearing, how much loss they had suffered in their own lives, how they felt about the fate of young women in our culture. Indeed, grief, rather like sexuality, reminds us just how much we are too much for ourselves, how intense our loves and longings really are. How would we know who could tell us whether we were overreacting to someone's death? Or indeed, when our grieving is excessive and should come to an end? We are too much for ourselves in our hungers and our desires, in our griefs and our commitments, in our loves and our hates, because we are unable to include so much of what we feel in the picture we have of ourselves. The whole idea of ourselves as excessive exposes how determined we are to have the wrong picture of what we are like, of how fanatically ignorant we are about ourselves. We describe people as excessively violent not when they are being more violent than they really are or should be, but because they are being more violent than we want them to be. They are showing us what people are capable of, we may want to think that people who torture people, people who are committed to ethnic cleansing, people who will kill themselves and others for their beliefs, are the exceptions that prove the rule. But actually they reveal to us what certain people in certain situations, certain predicaments, actually want to do. Excessive behaviour tells us more than we want to hear about who we are, about what we want to say to each other, and what we might be capable of. An adolescence, when children begin to have the physical capacity to murder and conceive, is our more conscious initiation into those very excesses that make us who we are, and of course, who we might become. Adolescents are excessive compared with the children they once were and the adults they are supposed to become. But adolescence, at least for modern people, seems to be peculiarly difficult to grow out of. Indeed, one of the biggest problems that adolescents have now is that the adults often envy them. And what contemporary adults tend to envy about adolescents is their excessive behaviour. The contemporary idealisation of adolescence is telling us something about how we manage our complicated feelings about being too much for ourselves. We secretly believe adolescents are having more fun, more pleasure, more passionate intensity than we are. And more publicly we talk about how they need to be disciplined. 
We talk about stamping out knife crimes, but not about how frightened someone might feel if they have to carry a knife. Nor indeed how exhilarating and potent a young man might feel when he is carrying a knife. We talk about fear of teenage pregnancy, but not of the intense excitements of discovering sex and being able to experiment with it. Nor do we talk much about the fear and confusion and grief that sexuality brings in its wake because it is so pleasurable or not pleasurable enough because it is such an essential part of who we happen to be. With adolescence, there's always what the adults think of as excessive behaviour around. Excessive isolation, excessive gregariousness, excessive moodiness, too much drink and too many drugs. The adolescent, in other words, tends to meet excess with excess. Excessive boredom is cured by excessive excitement. Excessive despair is cured by excessive idealism. Excessive uncertainty is cured by excessive conviction. But then how do you start to look after yourself after you've been looked after for so long? Human beings, after all, are excessively dependent animals, relying on their parents far longer than any other mammal. And what do you do when you are quite patently more than your parents can cope with, when you and they finally cannot avoid the fact that you are too much for them? If, in adolescence, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom, then the palace of wisdom must be adulthood. Adolescents are not overreacting to puberty and the world they find themselves in, any more than the parents of adolescents are overreacting in their extremes of rage and delight and despair. Adolescents and their parents who were once adolescents are simply experiencing two kinds of helplessness. The helplessness born of experience and the helplessness born of lack of experience. The adolescents are too much for their parents and too much for themselves. Parents are just people who have spent more time being too much for themselves. Because adults, of course, are not less excessive in their behaviour than adolescents. Concentration camps were not run by adolescents. Adolescents are not mostly alcoholics or millionaires because they haven't had the time to be. Excessive behaviour, in other words, is not so much something we grow out of, but something we grow into. We only seem to overreact to the most ordinary things in the world. Birth and death, hunger and sex, love and loss, and of course, ageing. The more we think about the road of excess, of just how excessively excessive we are as animals, the question becomes not, why are we so excessive, but how could we not be? given what we have to deal with. Perhaps excess is a word we use to reassure ourselves that we can be something other than excessive. If we start off by being, at least some of the time, too much for other people, and become, in adolescence, definitively too much for other people, so much so that we have to leave them, and then become adults who are unavoidably too much for ourselves, what is to be done? Well, one thing that can be done is to find someone we are not too much for. Tomorrow night, in my final talk, I will discuss religious fanaticism. And that's at the same time, 11 o'clock tomorrow night. This week's essays are presented by writer and psychotherapist Adam Phillips and they're a Boner broadcasting production for BBC Radio 3.